Ladies and gentlemen, let me extend to all of you this evening a very warm welcome to the IILM Global Thinker Award Ceremony. This is the 12th Global Thinker Award. Our previous awardees, whose portraits you can see behind you, have been Lord Bhikkhu Parekh, Dr. M.S. Swaminathan, Professor C.K. Prahlad, Lord Meghnath Desai, Dr. Shashi Tharoor, Professor Andre Betel, Mr. Sam Petroda, Mr. Naveen Jain, Professor Ashish Nanda, and Professor Jagdish Seth, whom actually we have with us here present. To get engaged with the global academic community, as well as to provide a forum for policy debate on issues of international importance, IILM instituted the Global Thinker Award in 2006. IILM was itself established in 1993. The institution has now grown from a management school to a full-fledged university at Gurugram with a total of 3,000 students. Through 12,000 alumni who work in reputed companies and manage their own businesses, IILM has made more than a small contribution to nation building. IILM has five institutions of higher education with over 300 faculty members. All these institutions are accredited by UGC, AICTE, NBA, NAC, and other accreditation bodies. Ensuring quality remains the motto. But let me now turn to this year's awardee, my very dear friend and colleague, Mr. Amitabh Kant, CEO, Niti Aayog. If I were to begin by saying that Amitabh retired after a very distinguished record in civil service, in March of 2016, I'm sure all of you would wonder, what the hell am I talking about? The fact is, Napoleon is famously reputed to have said, impossible is a word not in my dictionary. Subsequently, he is reputed to have said, impossible is a word in the dictionary of fools. To Amitabh, the word retirement is certainly not in his lexicon. Because when he retired and when he continued to serve government as he does now, he moved so seamlessly from one to the other that frankly speaking, when retirement came at where it went, nobody ever recalls. The other thing I wanted to say was that each one of us survives in a system, whether it is the private sector, the public sector, education, health, wherever you are, people live within a system. And most of us, like it or not, spend a lot of time criticizing the system, blaming the system, cursing the system. But there are those infinitesimally small amount of individuals who actually use the system, don't spend time criticizing it, but using it to achieve things that even the system itself cannot imagine. And Amitav is one of those. To the bureaucracy, he brought a freshness, a kind of vigor, a kind of far-sightedness that very few bureaucrats ever get to. And therein lies what he has been able to achieve. From the system, he has elevated it to a whole new level. Credit to you, Amitav, completely. Today, we are actually giving away the Global Thinker Award. And therefore, so much of all this is about thought, is about thoughtfulness, 
is about ideas, is about ideation. And here is a person who's been doing it now for so long, whether it began with God's own country, whether it was incredible India, the kind of passion that he has brought to the ideals of make in India, start up India, anything you talk about today, there is a connection, a synergic connection with Amitav Kant. The other part is this, one is to have ideas. And the very fecundity of those ideas, the fact that they are seminal is important. But much more than that perhaps, is how you articulate them, how you disseminate them. And all of these people behind you that you see have not only had ideas, but have spoken about them, communicated them, disseminated them in a way that people can understand, that the average human being can relate to. And that really is the way that Amitav has shown us. And whether he's speaking at Davos, whether he's speaking at any conclave of individuals, and I've heard him so many times, that articulation, that ability to communicate is absolutely par excellence. And therein actually lies the essence or the heart of why this particular award was instituted. Idea, ideation, and then the articulation of it. I would not take up any more of your time because there is so much that we need to hear from those who are on the stage already. So without further ado, let me call upon Professor Atima Mankotia to read from the citation. Thank you. Sri Amitabh Kant represents the best tradition of Indian bureaucracy that is being socially sensitive and rooted while pursuing the global benchmarks in administration and policies. Presently CEO of National Institution for Transforming India, Niti Aayog, he's a member of the Indian Administrative Service, IAS Kerala Kader, 1980 batch. Sri Kant has an illustrious educational background before joining Indian Administrative Service. He is an alumnus of Modern School Delhi. He did economic honors from St. Stephen's College, Delhi University, and MA from Jawaharlal Nehru University. During his service, he has also undertaken a midterm course with John F. Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University, and the Indian Institute of Management, IIM Ahmedabad. He is also a achieving scholar. Sri Amitabh Kant is a thought leader and an innovator par excellence. He is the author of the book, Branding India, An Incredible Story. His recent book, The Path Ahead, Transformative Ideas for India, which he has edited, lays down the path to transform Indian economy and society. His deep commitment to India comes through in his introduction to the book. Connecting the socio-economic trends which define India, he weaves the vision for transformation of India and the role of policymakers, industrialists, academicians, and the common man in that. To quote from his book, millions of young Indians are entering the workforce annually with a continually major shift from rural to urban areas and a burgeoning middle class with demands and expectations of quality, health, and education, further increasing the dependence on sustainable, variable, and continuous growth. Clearly, India is at a delicate juncture where the new generation of policymakers must take responsibility to work adeptly in tandem with industrialists, academicians, and a common man to form impactful policies. Sri Khan's contribution as a bureaucrat is immense in formulating and implementing policies at the ground level. He has been key driver of Make in India, Startup India, Incredible India and God's Own Country initiatives that position India and the state of Kerala as leading manufacturing and tourism destinations. These campaigns have won several international awards and embraced a host of activities. Infrastructure development, product enhancement, private-public partnership, 
and positioning and branding based on extensive market research. Sri Amitabh Kant has been chairman and CEO of the Delhi Mumbai Industrial Corridor Development Corporation. The Delhi Mumbai Industrial Corridor has been developed by the Government of India as a global manufacturing and investment destination supported by the world class infrastructure and enabling policy framework. The DMIC project is aimed at the development of futuristic smart industrial cities in India, which will converge and integrate next generation technologies across sectors. Soon we will see the transformation of India with so many cities, industry and education clusters emerging. In his capacity as secretary, Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion, Government of India, he vigorously drove the ease of doing business initiative and ranking of states on outcome parameters. These initiatives have led to India making a quantum jump in the World uh, Bank's ease of doing index and enabled Indian states to compete in the spirit of competitive federalism. He has made huge contribution to the state of Kerala as an administrator. During his tenure in Kerala, he structured the Calicut Airport as a private sector pro project based on users' fee and developed the BSCS project and Mutton Cherry Bridge under the private-public partnership. He was also responsible for introducing new technology, fiberglass craft and outboard motor in the fishery sector and launching beach level auctions, which substantially enhanced returns to the traditional fishermen. Sri Kant has been the recipient of Economic Times Policy Change Agent of the Year Award, the Bloomberg TV Personality of the Year Award, the NDTV Administration, uh, Administrator of the Year Award, and the Distinguished Fellowship of the Institution or Institute of Directors. He's a member of the steering board of shaping the future of production systems of World Economic Forum. He's also the recipient of Sir Edmund Hillary Fellowship awarded by the Prime Minister of New Zealand. IALM takes great pride in conferring the Global Thinker Award to such an illustrious personality who's a rare combination of a thinker and a doer. May I now request Mrs. Malvika Rai and Professor Jagdish Sheet to confer the 12th Global Thinker Award on Sri Amitabh Kant. May I now request Sri Amitabh Khan to deliver his lecture. Uh, Mr. Bhaskar Chatterjee, uh, Professor Seth, uh, Ms. Malvika Rai, uh, Smita Gupta, uh, very distinguished guests in the audience, particularly Mr. Qureshi, Mr. Anil Rai, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm extremely honored and uh, greatly humbled to receive this very uh, distinguished award. And I'm particularly humbled to see the vast galaxy of very distinguished people who've received this award earlier, and particularly Professor Seth, whom I've had the honor and privilege of interacting earlier. So, uh, Malvika, I'm really honored and I'm delighted and my particular thanks to you. And I'm, I would like to uh, thank uh, Mr. Bhaskar Chatterjee for his very, very kind words. Uh, he's been a very distinguished senior of mine in the service and uh, hearing those very kind words from him was a very, very humbling experience. So ladies and gentlemen, I've uh, worked in uh, both the North and South Block of India, and both these blocks managed to block just about everything in India. Uh, and uh, Anil asked me to speak on what it'll take to 
make India f a five trillion dollar economy. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, we are growing at about roughly 7% per annum. The challenge is to accelerate the growth. If India is to become a $5 trillion economy by 2024, you need to grow at roughly about 8% plus year after year, year after year till then. Your investment rate is to rise very substantially and your saving rate needs to expand in a very vigorous manner. And uh, I think the challenge is not about a $5 trillion economy, but really uh, grow at high rates of 9 to 10% over a th three decade period to be able to lift a very, very young population above the poverty line. India is passing through a window of demographic transition, which rarely happens in history. And rarely have country not created wealth when they are very light dependency burdens. And therefore, it's important to understand that our average age is 29, 72% of our population is below the age of 32. And it's like the baby boomers of UK from 46 to 64, when huge amount of wealth was created because of this demographic pattern of the society. And therefore, if India is to grow at high rates, not for the $5 trillion economy by 24, not for the $10 trillion economy of 2030, but we need to have a bigger term vision of growing rapidly for the next three decades to be just be able to lift a huge segment of our population above the poverty line. And what does India need to do to do that? I think first and foremost, it's important to understand that we'd, we've made ourselves over the years a very, very complex, a very complicated, and a very difficult place to do business in. My belief is that growth is driven by the private sector and the government has to act as a facilitator and as a catalyst. And unless and until we don't create the right environment for the private sector to grow and prosper, it'll be very difficult for India to grow in the long run. And therefore, India has to become a very, very simple and a very easy place for doing business in. Fortunately, in the last four to five years, there's been a lot of focus on this. We've, uh, over the years, added a lot of rules, regulation, procedures, paperwork, acts, laws, one after another, both in center and in states. And this has made India very, very difficult. And this has given enormous powers to lower rungs of bureaucracy, higher rungs of bureaucracy, to stop and impede growth. And therefore, in the last four to five years, we've tried to digitize every sector of the economy. We've tried to ensure that human touch is done away with. And this has led to actually India doing away with 1,400 laws. It's led to India jumping up about 65 positions in the World Bank ease of doing business. It's not that we need to improve for World Bank's sake. We need to improve for our own sake. Uh, and therefore, while we are 77 right now at the World Bank ease of doing business, our challenge is in the next two years to reach the top 50 and the next four years to reach the top 25 and make India extremely easy and simple. But India is a very large country. It's bigger than 24 countries of Europe and much of the business is done at the states. And therefore, states have to be made easy and simple. So we started making the states, we listed down outcomes and we started making the states compete with them. The first year we did this, Gujarat came number one. The very next year, Andhra beat Gujarat. And the third year we did this, Telangana, which was a newly constituted state, beat both Andhra and Gujarat. But the great thing was that the eastern states of India, Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh did extremely well. They improved, they radically improved on labor laws, they made themselves far more easier, and they jumped up to fourth and fifth position. And my belief is that if the mineral-rich states of eastern India continue to improve on ease of doing business, India will rapidly grow. And this, to my mind, was a significant improvement.
The second point I want to make is that irrespective of this talk of protectionism around the world, it, irrespective of what the global trade was between USA and China, it's very important that India pushes aggressively for globalization. No country in the world has grown on the back of protectionism. In fact, Globalization has lifted a huge segments of population above poverty line across the world in the last several decades. And therefore, India must be a very strong advocate of globalization. In the last four to five years, we've opened up our economy in many areas for foreign direct investment. We opened up from defense to real estate to housing to e-commerce to insurance, many, many areas. And our FDI has actually grown by 66% at a point of time when FDI across the world has fallen by 13%. And I think we need to continue opening up India's economy so that we get the best technology, the best companies, and the best, uh, the top class uh, all the leading entrepreneurs of the world so that India continues to grow and expand and puts pressure on the domestic enterprise to also grow and expand and technology spreads across the sector. So I'm a great believer in globalization and I'm a great believer in opening up India's economy. The third point I want to make is that if India is to become a $5 trillion economy, it's very important that urbanization must play a very critical role. As I speak here today, every minute there are 30 Indians moving from rural areas to urban areas. If you go by the latest McKinsey study, by 2050 you'll have 500 million Indians getting into the process of urbanization. This implies that the challenge for India is to create two Americas, two Americas. And whether we like it or not, urbanization is inevitable. If you travel from here to Jaipur, you'll see a lot of urbanization, but it's all unplanned, unscientific urbanization. The challenge is how do we do good planned urbanization? When America urbanized, when, when the European world urbanized, land, gas, and water were all cheaply available. And because they were cheaply available, America had the luxury of creating cities like Atlanta, where 99% of the people travel by car. You could live in New Jersey. You could uh, take a limousine, guzzle gas, travel to New York. Uh, those days are over. The process of urbanization across America, across Europe, across China has ended. The process of urbanization has just begun in India. And for the next five decades, we'll do more urbanization than what we have done in the last 5,000 years. But we'll do it at a point when land, gas, and water will all be scarce commodities. And therefore, how do we recycle our water? How do we recycle our waste? How do we do good planned urbanization in the back of public transportation will really hold the key to the success of India. And urbanization is important because cities, while they account for just 3% of the Earth land mass, they account for almost 82% of the global GDP. 82% of the global GDP coming from 3% of the Earth land mass, but they also account for 78% of the CO2 emission. And therefore, the challenge for India is that how does it create cities which are innovative and which are sustainable? And if we are able to build the right model for India, or we'll be able to actually create a model for the rest of the world. And therefore, urbanization is critical if India has to grow, but this has to be urbanization which is extremely sustainable and innovative for the future. And this, to my mind, is critical. The fourth point I want to make is that actually India has carried out some very far-reaching structural reforms. The goods and services tax, which actually uh, replaces 17 tax in the economy, uh, is a very far-reaching uh, far reform. Uh, this is like putting one tax across entire Europe. Uh, whole lines of queues across state boundaries and state borders have been done away with. And this, to my mind, will lead to a huge formalization of India's economy in the days to come. The insolvency and bankruptcy code has virtually ended the process of crony capitalism in India. Uh, earlier, uh, many businessmen had the luxury of borrowing from, from our nationalized banks and not repaying them or not putting their own equity. It's not possible to do it anymore. You'll lose your businesses, as many are seeing again. 
The third is a very major reform, which is the Real Estate uh, Regulation Act, and which really many middle class people, like some of you and me, who had booked houses with real estate property builders, never got their houses and lost their resources. So RERA is again a very critical act which brings discipline in the real estate sector. But to my mind, the most critical of all the reforms has been the direct benefit transfer scheme, which has led to about close to 500 schemes being direct where money is directly reaching the beneficiaries. One of our prime minister had earlier famously said that only 15 pesos of the money released by the government actually reaches the poor person. But today, in these 500 schemes, 90,000 crores has been saved by the government and almost 100% reaches the poor person because it's going straight into the bank account from which he withdraws using his biometric. And therefore, it's a very radical transformation for a country where huge leakages used to take place. And to my mind, these structural reforms, when they take place, they slow down the economy for two to three years, but then they accelerate the pace of growth. I think it's important that we accelerate the pace of growth now. The fourth point I want to make, or rather the fifth point I want to make is that actually India is the only country in the world which has a billion biometric. It's the only country in the world which has a billion bank account. It's the only country in the world which has a billion plus mobiles. And our mobile data consumption today is more than the mobile data consumption of China and USA put together. The cost of data is one-tenth the cost of data of the United Kingdom and almost one-twenty-second the cost of the United States of America. And therefore, what India will do is to throw up a huge amount of data. And as many of you would have realized, data would be the real driver of growth in the days to come. What this will do is to fuel a huge number of fintech to drive innovation and growth. There'll be data, there'll be machine learning, and there'll be a massive amount of artificial intelligence. We have close to 600 Indian startups working in the field of artificial intelligence. And this will enable India to actually lift vast segments of our population using data and artificial intelligence. You don't need to do this huge amount of work which used to be done in terms of physical work of transferring money, etc. India is the only country which is driving a huge amount of digital payment. We've created NPCI, which uses the Beam app to transfer money. It's we've created public highways. We've created public highways like NPCI. We've created NPCI, was, if it was a private sector body, its valuation probably would have been more than Google because it connects 144 banks at the back and integrates the digital payment in India. The other public highway that we have created is the goods and services tax. The public finance management system of the government is fully digital. In India, 99.7% of the people pay tax online, online, and 95% of them get settled in six months. We've brought in the new Aishman Bharat scheme, an Ayushman Bharat scheme provides insurance care for 500 million Indians, which is more than the population of United States, Europe, and Mexico put together. It's a totally cashless, paperless, portable scheme. So Ayushman Bharat, GST, income tax, all these, all these, and the digital payment will throw massive, massive amount of data which will drive truly the financial inclusion and growth of India using cutting edge technologies in the days to come. And this to my mind will be one of the key drivers. Now how India uses technology to leapfrog will be a very key challenge. Much like that, we, what we have done in mobile telephony where we leapfrog, much as we have done in Aadhaar where we've technologically leapfrogged, we need to leapfrog in many, many areas of growth. Quite often India had been getting into sunset areas of industry and once you get Get into the sunset area of industry, it's very difficult to penetrate global markets. But today, India has a huge opportunity. We missed out on the electronic revolution movement. India's opportunity lies in the electric vehicle movement. Once in electric vehicle, you're moving from 2,000 parts to 20 parts, all electronically managed. If India takes the lead in the EV markets, simply because in India, the Per capita usage of car is only 22 as compared to 972 in the United States of America. 
So you have a huge gap. And in future, if we shift to elect electric vehicles, you'll bring back and capture the electric revolution market. And therefore, to my mind, it's important that India gets into the sunrise areas of industry, whether it's electric vehicles, whether it's giga batteries, or whether it's the solar world. All these will be the cutting edge areas of the future, and India must capture these areas. The sixth point I want to make is that India is seeing a tremendous energy, vibrancy, and dynamism in its startup movement. It's quite unparalleled. When we started the Startup India movement, most of our startups were either going to the United States of America, to the Silicon Valley, or they were going to the Singapore. Today, we are seeing a reverse movement. Actually, Mitra Biotech, which does personalized cancer care, was re recently relocated from United States, from Silicon Valley into Bangalore. Uh, the kind of uh, unique movement that we are seeing is really unparalleled. It's not that e-commerce company like Flipkart was bought for 20 billion. It was the highest valuation in the startup world ever done across the world by Walmart. I came across this girl who, who started by teaching Japanese and Mandarin, uh, by starting doing a startup called Culture Alley, but soon realized that Indians actually want to learn English. In one year's time, she's taught nine million Indians how to speak English through her app called Hello English. Nine million Indians. Her name is Pranshu Bhandari. Uh, I came across another girl, Aditi. Uh, she runs a startup called Imbibe. And in Imbibe, she uses artificial intelligence to track every single student in the state of Rajasthan longitudinally and latitudinally, like we track Uber vehicles. And this has enabled her to provide extra dosage of education to those who lag behind in maths, statistics, in, edu in, uh, in uh, science, physics, chemistry. And this has led to Rajasthan's learning outcomes being massively improved. Simply use of artificial intelligence by a young startup. We've seen Satyo, we've seen Walsar Labs, all providing real-time inputs to our farmers based on the weather condition and soil conditions leading to the right kind of inputs and enhancing the production and productivity. Uh, I was recently at the ET Award in Bangalore for the startups and I came across this phenomenal startup called Delivery which is actually replacing the India Post in the movement of goods. Five lakh parcels a day they deliver. Five lakh parcels a day. They reach out to almost 70,000 pin codes and it's quite unparalleled of what they've achieved. So you are seeing a kind of disruption which has never been seen before. And good companies which do not innovate, which do not progress, will be overtaken by startups. In the world of electric vehicles itself, there are close to 20 young Indian startups which are driving the EV movement today, from storage to swapping to many other areas. And therefore, it's a, it's a huge, huge uh, movement. The challenge is that they are not trying to find solution for just, you know, the Silicon Valley has always been very innovative. But Silicon Valley does not have any challenges. The challenge of converting waste into energy, the challenge of cleaning your water, the challenge of being able to build flyovers in 40 days, the challenge of electric vehicles, of storage, all lie in India. And if these startups are able to find solutions for the 1.3 billion people of India, they will be actually finding a solution for the 7.5 billion people of the world who will be moving from poverty to middle class in the next two decades. And therefore, the market is not India, but the market is the 7.5 billion people of the world. And that's a huge, huge market. And therefore, India needs a lot of young disruption in the days to come from many of our young people. The seventh point I want to make is that actually in reality, India has in the last uh, five to six years become a center of huge amount of innovation. Many of us do not realize this, but close to 1,400 multinational corporations, uh, their engineering R&D has relocated to cities like Bangalore, Hyderabad, Pune, all here. And they employ close to over 110,000 Indians just doing engineering R&D. I was at the Shell Engineering and R&D facility at Bangalore a couple of weeks back. They, they've just converted Indian waste into BS6 standard diesel and Shell. And they say it's, it's far more advanced than 
imported oil uh, or imported petrol. Uh, you look at John Deere's 60 HP tractor, it was innovated here. You look at the GE's uh, low-cost TCG machine, which used to be made for $35,000, was innovated for $3,500 here, enabling them to do an ECG for $1. If you look at, uh, uh, you know, Honeywell's turbocharger, or if you look at Philips low-cost sound recording machine, all innovated from here. So from Cisco to IBM uh, or SAP's entire uh, software for the fashion world has all been innovated in India. Samsung's 2G, 3G, 4G, all innovated from India. Uh, each one of them has done cutting edge innovation starting from Texas Instrument in the late 90s. Cutting edge innovation for the world has happened from India and Indians must have a great sense of pride of this fact, which many Indians do not realize. And today, there's not a single multinational corporation across the world which doesn't do its engineering R&D from India and for the rest of the world. And therefore, India, to my mind, has been a highly innovative nation, and this innovation must spread rapidly across all sectors of Indian economy. The eighth point I want to make is that actually uh, our infrastructure story of physical infrastructure creation has also just begun. And you, we are the only country in the world which is doing 100 smart cities. We are the only country in the world which is doing 50 metros. We are driving the dedicated freight corridor which will connect Delhi to Mumbai. Today it takes 14 days for goods to reach the ports on the western coast of India. By next year end, you'll see this reaching in 14 hours. So from 14 days to 14 hours will be the paradigm shift. We are doing high speed train from Mumbai to Ahmedabad and many other projects across India. And therefore, uh, India's physical infrastructure story has also just begun and you'll see a lot of world class infrastructure being created. It's a massive opportunity for the rest of the world. Uh, I've, I've spoken a lot about what has been done or what what India has achieved. Let me also dwell a little bit on what are the challenges. And there are several challenges which India has. Many, many challenges if India has to achieve this rapid rate of 9 to 10% growth over a three decade period. I think first and foremost to my mind is that there is a huge gender disparity in India. Only 28% of Indian women work. The worldwide average is 48%. If India does not reach that world average of 48%, we'll, almost half of our working age uh, population will not be adding wealth to India's society. And therefore, if we were to take it to the global average of 48%, we'll add $700 billion to India's economy. And therefore, it's very important that we focus on health and education of women, and we are able to ensure that women are put into very uh, leading push positions of decision making so that women can be the key driver of India's growth. Unless that happens, it'll be very difficult for India to grow. And therefore, gender parity is critical. And in every sector of India's economy, which we have opened up, which we've opened up, women have actually outsmarted and done better than boys. When I was studying in St. Stephen's College, it was an all-male bastion. There were no girls. Actually, it became quiet the year I was passing out. By the time my daughter went to St. Stephen's College, her class had almost 85% girls. There were hardly any boys. And at that time, the principal of St. Stephen's College, Mr. Mr. Tampu, said that actually we should give uh, extra marks to boys so that the college can remain quiet. You know, many of the alumni of the college laughed and joked about it. But then when I went to the Christchurch College in Bangalore, I could only see girls everywhere. So I asked the vice chancellor that, Aunt, isn't this a co-ed college? Uh, so he said, he said it's co-ed and we give 15% extra marks and yet only the girls are getting in, boys are finding it difficult. So boys in India are doing disastrously badly, the girls are doing much better and therefore you need to keep providing greater and greater opportunities for girls to do better and better and better and get into positions of decision making. That's number one. Second is that no country in the world which has 58% population living in agriculture can grow rapid rates without massive structural reforms in our agriculture sector. 
We've put huge constraints on our farmers, and we've created a whole set of middlemen in the agriculture sector. Unless and until we don't do away with the Essential Commodity Act, we don't do away with the APMS Act, unless we don't provide them information and knowledge on the market price, unless we don't allow technology to fl flow to our farmers, and unless we don't allow them greater access to markets, agriculture will not grow, and it'll be very difficult for farmers to enhance their productivity and get higher earnings. And agriculture requires massive structural reforms. It requires all the political and administrative will to be able to provide technology, better information, better access to markets, and this, to my mind, is critical. We need a second green revolution, but we also need to move away from paddy and wheat, because paddy and wheat and sugarcane, which are consuming massive amount of water. 90% of India's water goes into agriculture, states like Maharashtra, 4% of land for sugarcane, taking 70% of the water. We are digging down to a level where you are taking out uranium in Punjab and spreading cancer. We are leaving nothing for future generations. And therefore, we need to shift to millets, we need to shift to pulses, and we need to ensure that these are procured for the largest midday meal and our anganwadis and for, our, uh, 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 for, the, for the children so that their nutritional standard can improve. And this is critical change of cropping pattern and change of behavior in agriculture holds the key to India's future in many ways. Otherwise, we'll have no water left for future generations. The third point I want to make is that no country in the world, no country in the world has grown without being a great exporting nation. Post-World War II, whether it was Japan, whether it was Korea, whether it was Taiwan, none of them, none of them have grown without penetrating American markets. And while India talks about a large domestic market, let me assure you that the, you get 10x the value if you export. And therefore, every Indian businessman should look at, not at India, but at the globe, at the world and its ability to penetrate global markets. And without penetrating global markets, it'll be very difficult for India to grow. Exports holds the key to our growth. And unless we don't grow rapidly at double digit in exports, it'll be very difficult to grow. And therefore, to my mind, you need a huge huge focus on exports, and exports in turn require a huge focus on manufacturing. It's no country in the world has grown only on the back of services sector. It's not possible to sustain it over a long period of time. The fourth point I want to, the fourth critical challenge which India has is that if you look at the map of India, there are, the South does very well in education and health and nutrition. The West does reasonably well. The North does reasonably well. But there are vast parts of India, largely in the eastern part of India, which remain backward. And in all of them, it's the nutrition, health, and education. Nutrition, health, and education keeps them back. And it's not an issue of money, let me assure you. It's an issue of lack of good governance in these districts. So 115 districts of India hold India backward. And unless and until these districts don't grow rapidly and we don't improve the human development index in these districts, India can never be able to sustain a 9 to 10% growth over a long period of time. And therefore, one of the key programs of this government is the aspirational district program where we monitor the performance of these districts, we work on real-time data, we focus on nutrition, health, and education, and agriculture, and skill, and we put out data on a real-time basis to the district collector so that they can compete. They're all competing, they're ranked, and they're awarded on the basis of their performance. And those who are doing well, are doing extremely well. And we're finding a very major radical transformation on the, on, in these districts. Our challenge to them is that in the next three years, they must perform better than the best districts of the state, and in five years, perform best uh, on par with the best districts in India. And to my mind, challenging them is spurring huge change in India. 
So ladies and gentlemen, I've given you a perspective of the positives and I've given you a perspective of the challenges of India to be able to grow not into merely a $5 trillion economy by 2024 or a $10 trillion economy by 2030. My perspective is that we must look at a three-decade period and we must lift our population above poverty line and we must become a key driver of change globally. Unless the India doesn't grow at 9 to 10%, we'll never be a key player in the globe and it's important that we do it so let me conclude with these last words by this 19th century Indian poet he was a Muslim he was a Muslim <coughs> living in Delhi his ancestry was Turkish he wrote in the Persian language so a Muslim writing in Persian Ancestry was Turkish, living in 19th century India. And he counted himself to be the luckiest man to have been born and to be living in India at that period. His name was Amir Khusro, and he said, how exhilarating is the atmosphere of India. There cannot be a better teacher than the way of life of his people. If any foreigner comes by, he will have to ask for nothing because they teach him how to smile like a flower and then the foreigner always goes back happy. So ladies and gentlemen, these are very exhilarating times in India. These are exhilarating times in India. It's important to smile like a flower and take India forward. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for a truly inspiring speech. Uh, may I request Professor Jagdish Sheth to say a few words? I do want to welcome you to the Club of Global Thought Leaders. I have personally gained in two ways by Amitabh Khan joining the group. Our average age has reduced. <laughs> and him joining the group, my height has increased. <laughs> Actually, there is a pedestal why I look taller than I am. And you saw he was uncomfortable there, you know? <laughs> it was too high. So I must tell you, that passion, that purpose, that mission-driven attitude is exactly what will make India in the future. India always had the potential. It's a question of who unlocks the potential and how do we do it? India has all the right ingredients. And I must tell you, whether you believe in the destiny or not, the timing seems to be right. We missed a couple of opportunities. At the time of India's independence, World War II had already taken place, and the Allies were looking for outsourcing manufacturing. And the first choice was India because the British had already outsourced way back early under an economist called David Ricardo, two key industries, steel and textiles, which is why we have textile and steel mills, because they would like to rather have value add where the raw materials were there, rather than export the raw materials to where the mills were. And that was the key change. Now, in order to manufacture where the raw materials are there, you have to build infrastructure, which is why we have the railroads and the waterways and everything. But we missed that opportunity in 1950s. They had a shortage of labor. Economies were growing very large. And they looked at India because India had the legal system, the financial system that was very compatible with both the British and, to some extent, the American. And that's the time when we said no, because we worried about recolonization of the nation, and we missed the boat. Today, there will be no China or Japan or Korea if India had embraced, at that time, modern manufacturing. We would be the leading manufacturing country in the world, supplying not only within the India market, at that time would have been mostly for export purposes, which is how, again, Amitabh Khan's comment is so important and relevant to talk about. 
We missed the opportunity again when India needed help under Mrs. Gandhi's emergency laws, needed a strategic partner, and again for our historical legacy between colonial power and our mindset at, at that time, we decided to align with the Soviet Union. We set the country apart by at least a quarter of a century in terms of changing its economy from what we call traditional mixed economy, licensed raj, whatever it is, and we are coming out. This is the third opportunity. This is the first time in the world, no matter where you go from Russia of today, Japan of today, South Korea, United States obviously, several parts of European Union countries who would rather see India's future in a very significant global power. World is with us, and I hope this time we do not miss the opportunity. Goddess Lakshmi seems to be blessing this country, and this is the time when you cannot go and say, I have a little dirty face here, or etc. Let me clean the face first before I take the blessings. You gotta take the blessings as it comes. Here are the key, key reasons I'm so optimistic about India. The first one is that the attitude has changed. Today, average Indian has the attitude of can do. It's possible. My generation grew up where I said it's impossible to do anything in India we can do better outside. I think that's a very key change. Our own mindset, self-image, has improved tremendously. Hoping that it doesn't become arrogance, that is the only danger on one side. But I think that self-image and self-attitude becomes very key. I remember in my early days traveling all over the world for export of machine tools from India. And I would go to the countries and they will laugh at India making heavy engineering products. That was all PowerPoint presentation in those days, fraud, etc. But we are very good at many things that the world does not even know. And I do remember my being treated not so well by many of the European countries as an Indian citizen. They thought I would there be there to settle in that country. I go back today and they smile at me. Germany, the person who takes my luggage to the Rim, smiles at me and says, are you a software engineer? Isn't that interesting? This is the acceptance of Indians all over the world, those who have migrated there. The Indian diaspora is so strong. That soft power we have created with our talent, which we invested in this country, the world is benefiting, and the world knows that it is benefiting, which is why they would rather come here than not. I also believe that India now has, for the first time, a government, as Amitabh mentioned, who would rather be an enabler rather than an obstacle. Digitization is absolutely essential. I remember my early days working in the MTNL, BSNL, DOT area. When we put the digital switch from Alcatel, which was a French company, first thing that happened was that the crossbar switch at a local district he cannot commit any fraud by linking the bill to one person and usage by somebody else. All the leakage gone away. He cannot do it. That's the time I realized computerization may be very important, not only for prevention, but also for data storage and eventually tracing in some fashion. So I think having digitization and digital India initiative across everything is probably the biggest transformation we will ever make. Building information highways would be more critical today than just railways in the days when industries, industrialization took place. And I think I'm very optimistic because the price points of putting information highways world class with the scale and the size that we have, world can only dream all can only drool, but not possible. People are still amazed how a country, which is an emerging economy, can have a world-class Aadhaar platform with hopefully so far no hacking done. That's a rare fit. I was in Singapore before coming here, 
at Singapore University of Technology and Design, or design at MIT collaboration. I went to one place where they do cyber attack war games, essentially in the all critical structural areas such as power plants, water plants, etc. And it's amazing to see the talent is mostly Indian. Again, as Abhida mentioned, world is coming here not for primarily cheap labor, but world-class R&D brain power. We have all contributed worldwide. Now it has time come to contribute within India. It's very possible today. So overall, I'm very optimistic. I think this transition from the unbranded consumption to branded consumption, the best outsourcing is no longer IT services companies like Wipro, Infosys, TCS, doing enterprise work for the rest of the world, but outsourcing has come home. Next generation of people do not know how to cook, clean or take care of the child. Things that you do at home is never counted in national accounts or toward the GDP calculation, but when I buy it in the marketplace, so from raw material to value add is about four to five times. So that's growing enormously. I want to tell you that I did recently significant research on tourism industry. I was amazed in 2017, in India alone, we had 1.3 billion tourists. I'm saying, makes no sense. All domestic. Have you seen these big kumbh melas? People go, they spend money. But it is all unorganized sector. How can we make it organized with GST? That's one approach. The unlocking of the potential is already taking place. And last comment I will make, because I know you have to go for other things. Four years ago, Bharat Desai, who is an IIT Bombay graduate, has a company called Sintel, wanted to start entrepreneurship at IIT Bombay. I asked him, he asked me to see if I would be the advisor. At that time at IIT Bombay, entrepreneurship was a small, sort of a dot in the sky, 30, 40 students only. This year, about 1,000 students will enroll. Remember, they are the brain power, no matter how you look at it. And they're all excited to be entrepreneurs. There's a school of entrepreneurship. And quite a few of them, in fact, all of them, not only start with a concept, create a prototype, incubate in the IIT Bombay incubator, get a seed money. We discourage them to go for ca venture capital yet because valuation will be a little better if you go further. And last Sunday when I was in Bombay, I met five teams. And just as you said, these breakthrough technologies they are creating is outstanding. One is making industrial robots for very dangerous places where humans can't go, like oil tanks where you have to clean the sludge. Or go into mines, which is very dangerous. 28, 29-year-old now, he started about two years ago at the company, probably will make about 1,000 robots this year. Invent here, market there, which is the export market. I saw a team of two PhDs, two different disciplines, have come out through chemistry, all the waste, all forms of waste, converted into very usable material, pellets, and that is not only biodegradable, but edible, replacing the plastic. Just fantastic. When you see these young people doing what they do, you feel realize there is a sense. And ultimately, the real competitive advantage of a nation is entrepreneurship, not capital, which is why Adam Smith added entrepreneurship as one additional factor of production, and that was more critical than land, labor, and capital. Remember, entrepreneurship is older than modern capitalism. It is time immemorial. People had been entrepreneurial for survival purposes, but entrepreneurship is the DNA of this nation. And the role of the government and the role of the private sector is to unlock that entrepreneurship for a very simple reason. This is a very diverse nation, more diverse than 
all of Europe put together by any count. Entrepreneurship does not recognize any boundaries. Young can be entrepreneurs, old can be entrepreneurs. Totally illiterate people are entrepreneurs, PhDs and scholars are entrepreneurs. Probably illiterate people do better than the scholars and the uh, scientists. Does not recognize gender. Men equally good entrepreneurs and women, and I think I'm so glad government is putting policy, at least a spotlight to say why women cannot be in the workplace or entrepreneurship, whatever they do, which is interesting. It does not recognize faith. All faiths have entrepreneurs. So literacy transcends. It transcends faith, transcends age, transcends gender. There is no more universal force for a nation than entrepreneurship. And we have plenty of that. I watch some of the Indian television programs back in Atlanta, and you see the talent on Sare Gama or some such program, the dance programs, and actually you cry with joy sitting in a foreign country, my pride goes up. There's a huge, huge soft power of this nation. And the next soft power we have to create, which again was Amita was pointing out, the most admired nations today are not based upon just faith, culture, religion, you know, belief systems. But it is based upon most admired brands and the products you create from the country. This is how Japan came out, South Korea came out, China is coming out right now. China is making excellent set of products for the world markets and domestic market we can do also. So I've belabored my point. Welcome Amitabh Khant to this elect select club. And I won't like to tell you, I personally feel so grateful somebody has put all your life together and still wants to contribute after retirement and which is a great thing. People like you will never retire. You will find something else to do. Thank you and congratulations. Shri Amitabh Kant, Professor Sheet, Mrs. Malvika Rai, Dr. Chatterjee, our board members, other dignitaries, faculty members, and students. Thank you, Shri Amitabh Kant, for taking out your time from your busy schedule to be with us today. This has indeed been a memorable evening. It has been an absolute delight and an immensely enriching experience hearing you lay the roadmap for the India becoming a $5 trillion economy. Thank you, Professor Jagdish Sheet, an honor to have you here and Dr. Bhaskar Chatterjee for your support and direction to make this event a success, and Mrs. Malvika Rai for being a pillar of strength. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. <laughs>